oxygen my very breath the source of life the source of rest oh, oh, oh I need you your Sing. 
has brought me to this place Because of you I freely live My life to you, Yahweh, I give So I stand before you, Yahweh I lift my voice cause you set me free that I
to fight for me.
where feet may fail And there I find you in the mystery In oceans deep My faith will stand
surprise my soul will rest in your embrace for i am yours and you are Shalom, everyone. Welcome to today's youth service. Start out with a prayer. Father Yahweh, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've done for us. I ask that you would watch over today and have all the people just be happy and greet each other and have a wonderful day. Thank you for letting us be able to congregate together and have a set apart day to worship you in Yahshua's name. Hallelujah. All right. Today is the theme is creation, as Luke said. But I am going to speaking about the wonders of creation and why we know for a fact that Yahweh is the creator of the earth. So let's get started with the first fact. The Grand Canyon has walls that are shaped sideways. So <clears throat> with layers of rock that are pushed together and they're sideways and that proves because it's all it's all over the world. So that proves that um, there was an earthly flood as Noah in the ark. Because we can see all over the world that there was sideways rocks. And you can't just have sideways rocks naturally. <laughs> so, the layers. Layers of rock. That's what I meant. <laughs> uh, and two, we can also see with very strong microscopes that the way we design an engine for a car is almost the exact same as the engines in our body that make our blood move and they're super small. Uh, Haley, are you ready to show that video? All right. Knock, knock. The doctor. Just the doctor. <laughs> Most won't get it. It's from a show, but it's a popular show. In Darwin's Black Box in 1996, uh, Behe spotlighted and made famous a number of really interesting discoveries that had been occurring in biochemistry and cell biology over the last two or three decades. And what, what biologists, molecular biologists, cell biologists, microbiologists have been discovering is that at the level of individual cells, there are little tiny examples of nanotechnology, little tiny machines at work. The flagellar motor is the one that Behe made most famous. It's a rotary engine that uh, powers a whip-like tail, a protein tail that functions like a propeller. And it moves the bacterium through liquid enabling the bacterium to essentially track down its food, its food supply. And this little machine includes a rotor, a stator, a drive shaft, a U-joint, bushings, bearings, and a whip-like tail that functions like a propeller. And the machine in some, in some bacterial systems turns at 100,000 RPMs in one direction and can reverse direction on a quarter of a turn and turn 100,000 RPM in the other direction. And bacterial flagellum is a true nanomachine about 40 nanometers in size. It's amazing. I mean, E. coli, salmonella, which are kind of our model systems for the bacterial flagellum, can propel the cell about 20 lengths per second through a very viscous medium, like water, to these organisms. And you extrapolate that to human um, scale. 20 body lengths per second, six foot person, you know, times 20, 120, 120 feet per second. Mark Spitz or Phelps would be setting uh, records with this type of propulsion. It's hardwired into a, a, 
a, a, signal a signal transduction circuit that allows the bacterium to sense changes in the sugar gradient in the, uh, in, in the surrounding liquid. This signal transduction system is actually a short-term memory system where the cell is, if it's going in the direction of an attractant, a nutrient that it can use um, to metabolize, it follows that chemical gradient. If it's a repellent, it will sense that and move in, in the opposite direction. So it's more than just this engine. It's an extraordinary piece of nanotechnology. It's high tech in low life. And so uh, just by spotlighting these extraordinary pieces of nanotechnology inside cells, and the flagellar motor wasn't the only one, uh, one by any means, Behe, in a sense, opened up uh, a window t for people. He opened up the black box of the, of the inner workings of the cell and said, look, this is a much more complica uh, complex than anything that, than, than anything that the early evolutionary biologists had envisioned. Darwin knew nothing of this type of nanotechnology in cells, and at the very least, we've got to come up with an explanation for this. All right. When I see the motor that is in such a small space and is just like that of a car, and it's like so small you can barely see it with a microscope, it, you, it can't just evolve from nothing. It's so complex, you can't just say, hey, bam, there's nothing. Oh, now it's the whole world with all this complexity. And saying it's just by chance is like throwing some Scrabble tiles, the pieces, throwing them and then just spelling out an amazing ton of words that are just aligned perfectly in order. There has to be a creator and designer. Another factor is that evolving from rocks can't happen. Take the bees and the flowers, for example. Evolutionists say that they, they had to evolve. Uh, <laughs> ah, that's weird the page. They need to evolve to live, therefore they did evolve. If that is so, then when the bees and the flower are evolving from rocks and they need each other for life but they don't have the aspects yet through the evolution to support each other's life, how can they live through the evolution? And how could a bee pollinate a flower if the bee can't pollinate? It can't. <laughs> but the Bible says in Genesis 1 11 through 12, let's go there. Then Yahweh said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in this itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields the seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And Yahweh saw that it was good. Then at verse 24 through 25, it says, Then Yahweh said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creeping things, and the beasts of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And Yahweh made the beast of the earth according to its kind, the cattle according to its kind, everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and Yahweh saw that it was good. So do you guys think that um, a flower can go a year without being pollinated? There we go. So what I see is there is so much proof for creation and the proof for evolution is not as believable. If you ask any person with no opinion whatsoever which one they would believe they would go with creation over evolution. But listen, evolution is a religion. Creation of the Bible is also a religion. The difference is that it takes more faith to believe in evolution than creation because it has nothing to start out with than a creator. All right, that's all I have for today. I hope you guys have a nice day, and don't forget to wear your seatbelt. <laughs> All right, uh, let's pray. 
Barukata Yahweh Lehenu, I thank you for this day. Yahweh, I pray that the words I speak this day would be yours and not my own, and that someone would get something from this, and that uh, it would be a great rest of the Sabbath. In your holy name we pray. Amen. All right, so I want to be completely honest. When it comes to creation, I am not the expert. I haven't really looked into it a lot because there's just so much controversy around it. I'd rather just stay unbiased on the topic. So lots of the time, I, I, when it came to this message, I was having some trouble uh, figuring out what I was going to talk about. So I'm actually approaching it from a different angle. It has less to do with more of uh, the creation story in and of itself and more to do with what we're creating, our creation. So, what are we creating? And in creating, I mean, what are we sowing into the world? What are we, what are other people seeing? Our paths are all different. They're all unique. But Yahweh wants us to have a certain path, the path of light. He wants us to take the narrow path. And one of the things that is more most uniquely human of pretty much anything really is our words and how much they can affect each other now when we look at the world the words of the world are hateful hypocritical and all around just not really fun to be around you open the news and you're pretty much tired by the end of it by the end of the six o'clock news because it's all just been depressing sad it's bringing you down The thing about that is that oftentimes, in common life, we're no better. We were raised in this culture of harsh words and things to oppress and hurt other people. And it's taken a toll on our being. Many times, we find ourselves in the same boat. We watch the news, and it's talking about a certain group of people or... Maybe the news is the certain group of people. And next thing you know, you're talking about that newscaster who says this, this, this. And the, the thing about that is there's, they're human too. The newscaster is valued just as much by the creator as everyone else is. <clears throat> it's actually kind of ironic because sometimes some of the greatest threads of hate actually came from a religion first. Many times the Bible. As soon as <laughs> the Crusades, I mean, that was a problem for a while. <laughs> I mean, it's been some of the greatest threads of hate have come from religion. Some of the greatest oppressors have been Christian. So we have to tread carefully on this idea, not approach anything regarding this topic in a hypocritical sense that we aren't doing it too. Because many times we are. And actually everyone has. We've all done it. One thing I really want to talk about is social media. Social media is what I call the devil's cauldron of hate and hypocrisy. It is number one place where people see things and feel sad automatically. I mean, social media is the reason that teenage suicide, depression, all of that is skyrocketed so much because now people don't have to say things to people face to face. You don't have to look them in the eyes when you tell them something. Or even, you know, you might be talking about someone behind their back, but now you can do it a hundred miles away. You know, when you're talking about someone behind their back, there's still the rest of the person that you're telling is going to go tell them. When you say it a thousand miles away, you never you you won't see that person. You don't see their reaction. You don't see that pain. It's gotten so much easier for teenagers and and people in general to just go out and express all of the the hate that they might feel towards someone, and it's taken a big toll on the youth. Um, this trend is just crazy in the world today. I mean, I mean the news, everything. Uh, it's funny. 
actually sometimes. Do you notice how obsessed we are with, with celebrities? I think it's kind of hilarious how obsessed people are. It's like, oh, Chris Pratt walked into the store. It's like it's a revelation. And I feel really bad for celebrities, honestly, because everything that they do is monitored. And everything that they do is judged harshly. Yet nowadays, you know, the news, it has comments and at the bottom of the article on, online. And you look at the comments, and they're all almost just berating the person, whether good or bad. They're doing, it's, it's just, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And just bringing them down. Uh, let's see. Proverbs 11.17 talks a bit about the power of our words. I have to turn there. So if you want to turn there too, that'd be fine. <laughs> <clears throat> Proverbs 11:17 says, "A man who is kind benefits himself, but a cruel man hurts himself." Um we are called to create love. We are called to create love with our words. And because your words reveal your soul. My dad has talked about it before. I didn't get the chance to talk to him today. But uh, Lashon Harar, evil speech, is one of the greater sins in the Bible. And actually, in the camp of Israel, uh, people were coming down with leprosy because they would be speaking evil of someone else. And that was the punishment for that. It was, it was leprosy because then everyone could see what you've done. Let's see, Proverbs 11.9 says, with his mouth, the godless man would destroy his neighbor. But by knowledge, the righteous are delivered. Words have power. That's something that we all need to remember throughout our days. I mean, Yeshua talks about how we're going to be held accountable for every, uh, every reckless word. Thank you. <laughs> for every reckless word. And that's kind of a scary thought because... Nowadays, I mean, speaking is almost taken for granted. <laughs> you know, you go about your day. I mean, we talk so much. I talk about this a lot, why we talk so much. We do. In Western culture, we love to hear ourselves. And that gets us in a lot of trouble in the long run. One thing that we see, we're supposed to mimic Christ, right? We're supposed to mimic Yeshua. And Yeshua never spoke hate of anyone person in the word he, he he never necessarily insulted anyone he just he would call people out occasionally and you know you could take that one way or another but it never he never spoke hate and that's something that we all need to you know think about a little bit more is that he didn't hate anyone humans were all made in Yahweh's image every human no matter what He, he loved everyone. Some, of, some people that we would even consider, uh, I mean, they, they'd be in so much trouble. An adulteress, such as in the case of John, John 8, 1 through 11. Uh, basically, the Pharisees came, of course, they had an adulteress. She was caught in adultery. And they said, what should we do? The word says we should stone her. And he says, well, uh, any of you who are sinless, go ahead and throw the first stone. And that's the thing. Calling other people out on what they're doing is hypocrisy on our part because everyone has sinned. We've all sinned. And we need to acknowledge that and just speak in love to everyone. <clears throat> Yeshua says to love as he is loved and to love those who persecute us. And in the world today, we could say that many people, indirectly and directly, are trying to persecute us. Our morals are constantly being attacked in today's day and age. But we can never speak ill of those people. We still have to be positive and in the spirit of Father. If we aren't creating 
love, then what are we making? Many times, and I'm going to kind of hit on something that Dwayne will like, um, <coughs> conspiracy theories, very popular in today's day and age. <laughs> very popular thing. And I'll admit, I was kind of, I was in that crowd for a while. I, I appreciate a good, good conspiracy theory. But the problem is, oftentimes they're founded on a little bit more than nothing. You know? And what's the goal of a conspiracy theory other than creating fear? and unrest in people based off little or no evidence. It's just kind of a seeking of something to be true that you really, you have no evidence of its truth. And oftentimes that makes people fearful. And fear is the number one thing that Yahweh is always talking about, wanting us to not have fear. So why would we do something that would evoke more of it? Before speaking and spreading fear or misinformation, we should thoroughly examine our words. This is going to be a shorter message than the last couple of mine. Sorry. <laughs> but one thing that came to mind when I was uh, putting this together was creating a legacy for our children, for future generations. Um, we need... I saw an image recently where there was there was a baby, basically. It, it was like a glass outline of a baby. And there was a hand pouring a vial that said hate on it into the, into the outline of the baby. And it, it was filling it up. And then there was vials of love and, and joy and all that to the side, but none of that was being poured in. Children are so... Impressionable? Yeah, that's the word. Children are so impressionable with what we say. And honestly, it's probably one of the bigger reasons why we have to watch what, every word that we say. Because children hear it. And they're going to grow up with the ideals that are put on them from the time that they're small. During the Song of Moses, um, Midrash, which is basically kind of Jewish extra biblical history, but this is really cool. I liked it. Um, Midrash states that even an, even the angels were singing during the Song of Moses, in which the Egyptians were were killed by the flood, and even the angels were singing with the Israelites. But Yahweh told the angels to stop singing, and they were like, "Why?" And He said, "Because those Egyptians, they were my children too, and they counted just as much to me as." Israelites and it made me sad that I had to kill them we have to remember this because it's very important every human is one of Yahweh's children and he loves each of us so dearly so to speak hate of one of his kids or to talk bad about other people is in essence talking bad about the father because he's in everyone John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. Whoever. No one is ever outside of being saved. No one is ever beyond it. <clears throat> In sowing hate, you will reap it back. And the thing with the future generations is just doing your best. <coughs> Whether poor or rich, both can make an impact on future generations. If a poor family lives a life of joy and love in the Father, their end result will be greater than the rich who live in hate. Their children will have joy, and they'll have something that they'll never lose. It will impact everyone forever. Um, in regards to this, we just have to listen in love. Proverbs seventeen twenty eight says, Even a fool is considered wise and discerning when they hold their tongues. We don't want to ever be creating hate. And we don't ever want to be creating lies. We need to pay attention to what we say. And instead of... It, 
I mean, if if you have nothing good to say, don't say it at all. That's one of the it's a great moral to live by. One of the few that aren't from the Bible are true. So, yeah. That's basically it. <laughs> Thank you. Set me 